<clears throat> All right, this week we're very excited to have Rose Wong presenting. Rose is a third year PhD student at Stanford University, advised by Noah Goodman, and is funded by the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. She is interested in cooperative AI systems, in particular, machine teachers for human learners. Uh, prior to her PhD, she was an undergrad at MIT, where she worked with professors Joshua Tenenbaum and Jonathan Howe, and interned at Google Brain and Google Brain Robotics. All right, thanks. Take it away, Rose. Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, um, so Natasha, like Natasha already said, I'm Rose, um, and today I'm going to be presenting some pretty new work um, called In the Zone, Measuring Difficulty and Progression in Curriculum Generation. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions in between. Um, I'm happy to take any of them. Yeah, so I guess uh, this presentation kind of starts off with uh, like very similarly to many other RL presentations, which is sort of just like taking it in all of the success that reinforcement learning has had in, um, you know, like game like environments such as Atari or AlphaGo. And it's been really exciting to sort of think about like how to extend these very powerful algorithms uh, to more real world like settings. Um, but one thing that I'm sure most of us are very cognizant of is that reinforcement learning is quite expensive to train. Um, so just to take, for example, uh, the AlphaGo Zero algorithm, they have this nice blog post that they post, put together where uh, on the X axis they talk about, um, you know, the uh, like amount number of days it took uh, to train AlphaGo Zero at, you know, uh, a particular either rating, uh, so on the Y axis. And so we can see, okay, three days, um, we started to surpass the original abilities of AlphaGo. 21 days, um, we're thinking the level of AlphaGo Master. Then 40 days, we're thinking like surpassing all prior versions. Um, but, you know, probably as most of us know, we don't really have 40 days just to, you know, iterate over a simple algorithm we want to test over. Um, another thing that we're pretty cognizant of is that like um, in a lot of environments that we do care about applying reinforcement learning algorithms to, um, they're generally not very um, capable of being able to like uh, be deployed out of domain, so be able to generalize. Um, you know, this is a, quite a uh, you know, well established and, um, you know, a challenge that we care about. And so um, how people try to address this before. So to try to enable uh, RL agents to be able to generalize, um, one thing that you know we might think of as the nice solution of training on all variations of the environment. But practically speaking, this is quite also very expensive. So um, like I already mentioned, algorithm training is expensive. Um, also getting very faithful environment simulators for the real world is incredibly challenging. And training on minor variations feels quite uh, wasteful. Um, so maybe an instantiation of this is, um, being able to solve the Rubik's cube from OpenAI, where they do domain domain randomization to enable their single hand um, to be able to solve the Rubik's cube from all kinds of like uh, you know, variations or angles. Um, yeah, so altogether, I think um, this sort of suggests that problems should probably be selected judiciously to do um, better or more efficient RL training. Um, instead of just picking uh, you know, random environment samples and then training our agents on it. Um, and so this is where a lot of the curriculum generation algorithms have emerged um, you know, to try to address this challenge. Um, and they're all vaguely sharing a very similar idea for the teacher objective, which is really honed in on the difficulty with respect to the student agent or like with respect to the reinforcement learning agent you're trying to train. So the teacher should be based, should be rewarded based on difficulty. I want to be able to generate tasks that are not too easy, otherwise it's pretty wasteful to train the agent on it, but also on tasks that are not too hard, otherwise the agent will most likely fail. And we've seen, um, I'm just going to list like, you know, three instantiations of this idea. Um, so most recently at iClear 2022, uh, um, there was this like, um, it takes four to tango uh, work, which builds on Paired, um, then we have Paired itself, um, working in mini grid environments. And then we have um, this uh, Golgan work, uh, which has been commonly used as a pretty strong and popular um, baseline when you're thinking about doing curriculum generation in a control setting. Um, 
But in general, like all of these works, uh, they they sort of emerge from a similar intuitive idea, but there's no sort of like overlapping framework that kind of describes or gives us an insight about the kinds of tasks that are that best enable student learning. And from there, being able to derive or think about a teacher objective. Um, so as you might guess, this is sort of where our work is heading. It's um, what we care about is reassessing how we formalize the teacher objective with respect to you know what has best enable uh, student learning and then from there being able to oper operationalize the teacher objective um yeah so key questions what kind of tasks and then how to reward the teacher uh to generate those kinds of tasks or to that end um cool so maybe like before i go on um i'll just pause here and just make sure that everyone's on board with the curriculum generation setting and sort of the, the objective of our work. Cool, okay. Um, like I said, feel free to uh, ask questions anytime. Um, so yeah, well, how have people thought about this problem before? Um, I think wait, one wait, of the wait, most- wait, wait, oh, yeah. Sorry, what, what, could you, could you back, go back to the previous slide? You said, how should yeah. the teacher be rewarded to this end? So wait, is, is the teacher also an agent now? yeah so we're thinking about this in uh so similar to for instance like the paired setting um where you, you're thinking about your teacher agent as also as a as an agent that can be trained by reward or can be trained essentially to generate goals okay i understand yeah um cool um yeah um so i think so okay to repeat questions, which task best enables student learning, and then how to uh, sort of incentivize the teacher to generate those kinds of tasks to the end. Um, one answer um, comes from uh, this like really rich area of developmental psychology, um, also emerges in education literature. This is the idea of a student's zone of proximal development. And this um, idea is basically saying that um, the tasks that lie within a student's zone of proximal development or ZPD are within a student's difficulty and they accelerate a student's learning progression. Super intuitive. Um, and you know, one might ask, like, isn't there a computational framework for this already? Um, especially because this idea is quite well established um, in these areas. Well, no. Um, so despite being very intuitive and very well widely known, and you know, people have attempted to, you know, incorporate these ideas also in real, uh, you know, uh, human student teaching settings, um, it lacks a computational framework. And this really makes operationalizing ZPD uh, for teaching, such as in curriculum generation, pretty hard. Um, and so our work is, is proposing Zone as um, a computational framework that operationalizes ZPD. Um, and so Zone is, attempting to be the answer for some of the key questions we asked before of describing the kinds of tasks that um, would best enable student learning and then also offering techniques for actually operationalizing that framework. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I'm just going to jump right into some preliminaries, some formalism, and describe like the typical you know, abstract version of a curriculum generation loop. Um, so uh, if people are not already familiar, maybe this is, we're going to start high level and then go a little bit more low level. Um, so you can kind of think about a curriculum generation loop as being two agents. You have a teacher agent and a student agent um, where the teacher agent is sampling tasks. So I'm denoting them as um, C curriculum or C curve. Um, you're sampling tasks and then you're sending these tasks to the student where the student will you can think of these as like uh, environment instantiations. Uh, the students will be initialized in the environment. It'll try to solve the task and they'll get a reward corresponding to that task. And um, you know, different algorithms will incorporate the reward in um, you know, different ways. Um, but in, in general, like the teacher gets information about the return of the students. Um, cool. Now going a little bit more low level, um, the way that we're going to formalize it, um, which is, a little bit maybe contrary to um, some, some other works, is we're going to think about this um, generating a task, um, so the seeker, as being um, a, a contextual MVP. So um, what is a contextual MVP made of? Um, well, we have our state sets, we have our action sets. Um, 
we also have our context. And this is what we're thinking that the teacher is sampling from or learning um, how to, uh, learning a distribution over these tasks. So we're going to think about context and tasks as interchangeable. Um, we have our reward function, which depends on the task that's, um, you know, the teacher picks from. But in general, um, you know, it's like I observe you take uh, an action from the state in this environment that I've given you and I'll give you a reward. Um, in our settings, we're going to think about this as like binary success. So either you did the task or you didn't do the task. So zero or one. Next is our transition function. So it's, you know, in this environment, you take the same action and then I produce a distribution or, you know, if we think about this as a stochastic, um, our environment with stochastic dynamics then it's a distribution over states that you might land up in. Um, and uh, uh, then we have our initial state distribution. So, um, you know, where you could be possibly initialized our discount factor and then um, this is exactly what the teacher is trying to learn. It's this distribution of our tasks. Um, so before I take Rupali's question, I'm just going to finish the notation. So um, we think about our teacher as a distribution of our tasks. So I'm just, you know, I'm learning it. I'm learning the teacher with a parameterized by phi um, to be able to sample context or be able to sample tasks. I give that task to the student where it's, um, it is executing its policy so mapping states to the actions um, and then getting a reward from that. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, Rupali, you had a question. Yeah, hey. Um, sorry, I don't have a lot of background on curriculum learning. I just want mm -hmm. to understand the reward here is uh, whose reward, the student's reward or the teacher's reward? Yeah, so right now, um, the reward that's shown here on the loop is just the student's reward, so what it got. Um, but we'll talk a bit more about, like, the, yeah, the teacher's reward as well, um, which mm -hmm. you, usually are sort of, you could think of it abstractly as a function of uh, what the student got, so whether it was able to su yeah. succeed on the task, yeah. and then some other factors that you may want to consider. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, but that's a good question. Um, sort of segues into the next slide, which is how should the teacher be rewarded? Um, yeah, uh, I just want to make sure that um, I'll stop here too. Sometimes formalism is it's a lot to take in, especially if you haven't seen it before. But in general, you can kind of think of like, my teacher is learning a distribution over tasks. So that's um, chi phi. And then my student is just a distribution over actions. So given state, I'll produce, you know, actions that I would like to take or, you know, wouldn't want to take in the state. Okay, cool. Um, so now with this uh, formalism, let's sort of start to think also from high level to low level, how we should think about the teacher reward. Um, so where we're going to start is um, we're going to use a bit of um, based probability theory to express what we want the teacher to do. And then later on, we're going to talk about how this, you know, in, to a certain extent already connects with existing curriculum generation algorithms and how we can actually improve those algorithms um, being informed by uh, this, this computational framework. So, um, so first, like, let's start high level and expressing this following objective using good old Bayes. Um, so on the high level, the, the teacher objective um, is to be able to construct a series of tasks or just tasks such that the student does well in the long run. And we're going to think about long run um, behavior uh, as being like test performance time. Um, so I have a held out set of tasks or just, you know, in the real world, there's just a bunch of tasks that I would not be able to faithfully generate in my environment. And th that's uh, essentially what I want, you know, that I care about um, on my student doing well on. So um, here's here's our first equation. Um, to, to sort of break it down, it is it is just capturing this high level idea. Um, so maybe walking um, us through this, this is supposed to be an optimization objective. What are we optimizing over? Well, we're optimizing over high five, which is, um, if you can remember, this is a distribution over curricula uh, or uh, tasks that um, my student, uh, my teacher is trying to learn. So I'm trying to train my teacher 
And the way that I get signal about how well my teacher is doing is going to be based off of, well, you know, trial and error. So I'm going to be able to pick a task from my current distribution. And then I'm going to essentially train my student on it, update it, and then test it. Um, so uh, the way you can see this is um, theta cur is denoting the, the student's policy at the time when it receives the curriculum. Um, and then it will receive this particular um, sample of the curriculum, so C curve. Um, and the way that we think about test is going to be using this uh, binary reward variable. So either you're successful or you weren't successful. We just care about success. So that's why I'm, or I, I just care about this reward being equal to one. And then I have some you know, test set of problems that um, I'm just going to denote as C test. Uh, does this sort of formalism, or this is like, I guess, first step make sense? So teacher, we're trying to train the teacher. The way that you evaluate how good that distribution is or how, I'm, you know, how I convert this to optimization objective for the teacher is by essentially evaluating it on the student. Um, okay, so we're going to take a couple more steps that just apply chain rules so it can be broken down into maybe a more um, like intuitive uh, term that we could ideally use uh, when training. Um, so in the, oh yes, wrong. Uh, we, talk, we talk about uh, testing the success and see whether it's one. That's for um, progressing to the next uh, step. Yeah, so um, you can think of this as just a one step. Uh, yeah, so I should have said this before, but this is a one step um, just to build some intuition. It's like a one step uh, curriculum um, formalism. So I'm going to, uh, we can think about this in the loop uh, here. So all that's happening is I'm just running one loop of this teacher. So I'm going to um, sample a curriculum for my current distribution. I'm going to give it to the student. Um, the students will train, um, it will update, and then I directly deploy that student from that task. Um, does that make sense? Uh, so you, you basically like wait for it to succeed in the, te in the test for that context, and then you give it a new context, yeah? Um, so in, in this formalism that I'm breaking down here, it's I pick, I sample a single task. The student will get that task. It'll try to execute that task. It might be successful, it might not be successful, but whatever experience it gets from that, it'll have to train and then update its parameters and then be deployed on test. And then I'm looking at basically my test performance. Okay, I understand. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is this. It, it might be a little bit. Um, like if, if there's something that's hard to understand that's like mostly my fault and not like your fault which is the reason why like i i want i prioritize like trying to get at least the first intuition um like in an understandable format before moving forward yeah um edward hi rosa um so are you testing across all the tasks in the test set or just sampling a few or yeah, so you can think of this. So we're not going to uh, the formalism that we're getting to. Um, you can think of it as a test set. You can think of it as a distribution that we sample from. But at least for now, like we don't care too much about the form in which the test distribution takes on. We're really just trying to express like my teacher is a distribution over context. I'm sampling from that, and I'm getting some kind of signal which I'll then try to update my teacher from. Um, so yeah, just think about this as like maybe for the easiest thing is just think about a set of problems. Um, so there's you know set of test problems that I then evaluate the student on. I see. Um, hmm. I I'm just wondering like mm -hmm. if you're just randomly sampling from the test set that you have mm -hmm. and then evaluating on it, uh, like. Uh, Maybe there could be some irrelevance between the type of task that you sample from the test set versus what the task that you're currently training on. Right. Like you're saying, um, you know, what if I train on Atari, but then I deploy on, um, I don't know, Go 
is that what you're saying like there's like no um this, um, this... uh let's say like uh uh no, so it's, it's not that extreme first of all uh, my point is let's say um i'm trying to come up with a, a suitable example here let's say you're 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 teaching uh for example uh uh mario how to like let's say you're uh training a super mario uh, super, uh right and then uh uh you're, you're teaching currently teaching a task uh to uh that is controlling an rl agent an rl agent that is controlling a, a super mario to mm -hmm. uh avoid any uh fires that the opponent is shooting towards Mario, uh, whereas mm -hmm. your test task is about uh, jumping any spaces that you may uh, fall into. Right, yeah, yeah. Right. So th there's a, a, it's the same uh, same environment, uh, Super mm -hmm. Mario, but there's a difference in the test that you're currently training for versus the tests that you're picking to, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, I think this formalism is not going to exactly express this idea of the teacher knowing the test set. Maybe like, you know, maybe one way to approach this where what if the teacher knows what the test set is, then it can curate the curriculum a priori to for it to do well on that test set. We're not going to make that assumption. I think like for better or for worse, we're making this as a very um sort of like, you know, you want to basically train your student agent to be well, as well prepared as possible on test set problems that um, you know might be just generally quite diverse um, or um, might share certain overlapping areas, but um, yeah, ideally to sort of do best case um, on on this like unknown test set um, or a period not unspecified test set, you want to be able to like enable uh, to do, generate like tasks that are that cover a broad. Uh, range of maybe skills that you care about um yeah and uh, this is also learning that like we're specifically taking um in consideration in this particular formalism but it's a completely valid question yeah um yeah right now our primary focus is like um very abstractly thinking like i make no assumptions about the relationship like not necessarily um between test and train um just that they're not like completely adversarially generated Mm -hmm. um and uh how should i then train or and you know how should i formalize my teacher objective and train my teacher um, yeah i don't want to block the discussion too much yeah go ahead thank you yeah no worries yeah no thanks for the question um cool so uh everything i'm going to be doing from now on is just applying chain rule um so uh there's nothing else really complicated going on although it might look a little bit intimidating um, so all I'm doing from step one to step two of this new line I've shown here is I'm just introducing two new random variables uh, that I want to take account for. Um, one of the random variables is, you know, did my student actually successfully do the curriculum task? So that's here the small r curve where we're thinking about it to either be zero or one. And then we're thinking about this continuous distribution, which is just taking into account to like all the possible like test time parameters my student could have been. Um, and the reason why we're accounting for this is because, um, like I said, it's, you know, you, you, you pick a task from your teacher, the teacher gives that task to the student, student trains on that task, and then it does like stochastic grading updates. Um, so because that's stochastic, like there's a bunch of different like tasks, or sorry, uh, test time parameters I could have gotten. And then from there, I actually deploy my student to evaluate on test. So that's all I'm doing here. It's just I'm sort of like breaking things down into this like, you know, train test uh, transfer time. Um, and then everything else is just going to think about conditional independence. Um, maybe if you want to actually look at the breakdown of things, um, feel free to look at the paper. But for now, let's maybe just focus on the lower um, equation and consume it. Um, so the first thing, uh, the first term is basically describing, like, if I give my uh, my student the task, um, how well does it do? So that's the reward that I'm getting. Like, given that task and the, the student's current parameters, how well does it do? Um, now, at the you know end of a training loop, what does one typically do? One performs grading updates, um, and so that's what the next term is expressing. It's okay, given that reward and you know the experiences you might have collected from this particular task and given your current parameters, you perform an update 
and you get um, you get a set of parameters. In particular, in our setting, we're just going to say that the teacher cares about the students, um, you know, maximizing the likelihood of it getting optimal test time parameters that we're den denoting here with theta star. Um, and then from there, um, you know, you evaluate your students, right? Um, so all this is this expression is just saying is like it's just expressing the training to test time, like uh, procedure, um, where the teacher really just cares about maximizing like the students' likelihood of doing well, so getting something close to theta star or something that is ideally theta star. Um, so yeah, so maybe just consuming in that equation, what you can see is. The teacher only has control over tasks that it, um, you know, are most likely to be sampled from a distribution. So everywhere that you see a C cur is where the teacher has impact on. What equations do these affect? Well, they affect the colored ones. Um, so first in red, it affects the difficulty of the problem that I'm giving to the student. And then second of all, it also impacts like, you know, how close am I getting to optimal test time parameters? Um, and so this is really like the two key components that we're going to focus on um, to at least operationalize this idea um, such that it's a little bit more practical to implement. Um, so, you know, one consideration of practicality is that I typically don't know if they start a priori. So what are some proxies for that? Um, but yeah, so this is this is the way that we're going to sort of um, this is the form of zone that we're going to use. And um, this kind of already builds on a lot of intuition we might already have. But ideally, like a little bit more formalized, at least uh, using this, like um, using Bayes theory. Um, cool. Yeah, Edward. I just uh, just at a high level. So mm -hmm. could you explain when you say zone? I guess you're referring to ZPD, right? That zone. Yeah. So. Um, so I'm just wondering. Zone is sort of like uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's like an abbreviation for uh, this like formalism and the techniques that we're going to introduce. But it's like motivated by the idea of ZPD, yeah. I see. And so, how is this um, ZPD reflected in this formulation? Yeah, um, I, I should have done a better callback here. So this is a really good question. But um, if there does exist a slide in the beginning of the presentation where I talk about um, the way that people in education or development psychology thought about tasks that are within a student's CPD are ones that are within the student's difficulty level um, and ones that also accelerate learning progression. And so um, the way that you can sort of think about this in this equation, um, just intuitively, is that ideally I want to be able to pick tasks, so seek her, that maximize this objective. Um, and, you know, in um, I guess there's there's been some work in more ML theory which say like if I pick a task, um, like for instance, you know, a task that's really easy, I might be able to maximize this term. So like my probability of success will be really high, but my probability of actually you know getting to uh, you know optimal test time parameters if I don't if I'm just training from scratch is going to be very low. So this whole term will be evaluated to be quite low. Um, and then conversely, if you think about picking really hard tasks, the probability of success will be very low, um, even though if I were to hypothetically, you know, uh, learn from that, uh, from that set of experiences, I might be able to, um, you know, get good test time parameters. And so where we're going to is like, actually, we sort of want something in the middle, right? Something that's not too easy, not too hard, but something that also is able to accelerate the agent's learning progress. So. Um, that's how like ZPD is incorporated here. Yeah. Mm, got it. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks for the question. Cool. Um, so, yeah. The next thing that we're moving on towards is like, okay, being informed by this formalism. Um, how can we make this more practical, right? Like, I. Um, yeah. So, the reason why this objective right now is this current form is not practical is because. You know, if you just stare at the red term, it's, you know, kind of getting in this idea of like, I, I pick a task and then I evaluate um, the students, um, you know, like multiple times on that task. And I'm basically trying to like uh, estimate its probability of success for every single task. 
Um, and then that's quite expensive. That actually adds more burden on um, our, a lot of the genera curriculum generation algorithms and would be, you know, take longer to run. Um, and so the way that we're going to offer sort of like a more practical technique for this is um, just a rejection sampling idea. So um, all the prior works typically estimate difficulty. So like in the form of return as the core objective. Um, and so, you know, broadly speaking, the algorithms, they reward the teacher if it's able to generate within, um, you know, reasonable interval that expresses like something that's not too easy. So like less than some minimum reward, but also not something that's not too hard. Um, or sorry, uh, other way around. If it's less than some minimum reward, it's too hard. If it's more than some maximum reward, it's too um, easy. Um, and so very simply to sort of get at this idea of we want to avoid both ends, um, what we're going to do is we're going to perform uh, rejection sampling. Um, so uh, in the current loop, what's happening is that the teacher samples a task, gives it to the student, and then is able to evaluate like, you know, how well did the student do? Um, the, the minor modification that we're doing here is that we are giving the students the original task as well. But before we actually train the student on those tasks, we evaluate its reward and we filter out the ones that don't satisfy that algorithm's difficulty criterion. Um, so if people aren't familiar with paired, and it's totally fine if they're not, um, but for people who are familiar with paired, you can think of this as like, I get negative regret because I'm not allowing for regret to be defined negatively. Um, and so those are the tasks that I'm essentially rejecting. Um, yeah, so I basically am evaluating my student first on the curriculum generation task, and then I'm training the students on, um, you know, the filter tasks that, um, do achieve, or that, that do meet that, that particular algorithm's difficulty criterion. Um, right, so, um, uh, so, yeah, because it's rejection sampling, typically, you know, if I have a batch, I always end up with a batch that is at most the size of my original batch. Um, and the way that we get around to you know, losing samples is that we're just copying samples that do meet the crit criterion. Um, yeah, for more details, feel free to check out um, the paper because I think it describes it slightly better. Um, uh, but moving in, moving forward, like uh, the next term is probably the one that's like the least practical to implement, which is like, I know what maybe like uh, my set um, of uh, optimal test time parameters are. So I'm going to try to pick tasks that like get the student closer to that. Um, reason why it's impractical is that, you know, I don't typically don't know that a priori. And so the way that we're going to think about this is that, um, you know, on the one hand, knowing the global maximizer is quite challenging, but also on the other hand, in these kinds of sparse reward settings, um, if I get a reward of uh, zero, um, empirically what you'll observe is that the the um, model will not update very much. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, a proxy for this term is that we're actually going to incentivize the teacher to generate tasks that um, induce very high model gradient norms. So it's incentivizing in these kinds of sparse reward settings that the student's model is changing. Um, so it, we're avoiding tasks that where the student will be evaluated to zero. Um, cool. I know that I think this sometimes, yeah, the, if, if people have questions on this, I'm happy to take um, questions. But probably um, because of time, I'm going to just move forward to like thinking about, I guess, describing uh, yeah, the experiments and just finishing the methods. Um, so yeah, if maybe combining this into a pseudocode might be more understandable. So um, we have our student, we have our teacher, and then we have some, you know, cur existing curriculum learning uh, algorithm. So either paired, Golgan, or some other algorithm. And uh, everything I'm marking in color are the ones that is being slightly modified. So the typical loop, like I said, is that you sample a bunch of tasks from the teacher, then you actually evaluate or you run, um, uh, the students on those tasks and you get a reward. And then what we're doing for rejection sampling is we're saying like, I'm going to look at this, the, uh, the algorithms like difficulty criterion and filter the ones that, uh, filter out the ones that don't meet that criterion. 
and then you know copy the ones that's used so i have um you know a batch that's of my original batch size um then i'm going to train the students on those filter tasks um and then i'm going to train my my teacher using um, not only the rewards that the student originally got but also combine it with um the gradient norms that um the student got from training um cool yeah um and typically in the in the settings um what i'm essentially doing is i'm going to add on the gradient norm um so i take the original uh curriculum learning um uh, reward and then i'm just going to add this additional term um yeah so maybe like specifically in our work we focus on a combination of algorithms that have worked pretty successfully on a con on both discrete and continuous settings so for paired and golgan um the experiments i'm just going to focus on paired um so um to provide a little bit more detail um uh the teacher is trained on this notion of regret where regret um cannot be defined negatively um and so typically what you do is that you want to um ensure that it's never yeah negative um in paired what happens is that you essentially have two student agents um, to approximate or to give the teacher its reward. So one student we're going to refer to RS, which is the student reward that I actually care about, um, versus uh, an, an anti-student, so R um, not S or minus S. Um, and so an original paired, we're just taking its original um, like uh, teacher reward, and we're, when we're considering uh, the gradient norm, I'm just going to add on the students so s's uh gradient norm from whatever it was trained on um so that is the reward of the teacher that's how we're incorporating um uh incorporating uh zones grad term uh, everything else is not changed so we don't do any like hyper parameter tuning for this it's just like injecting this two simple techniques rejection sampling gradient norm um cool in the paper, um, we evaluate on a mixture of discrete and continuous environments. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on Paired's original or a set of its hardest like uh, transfer environments, um, and then also uh, these like continuous environments here that, um, yeah, it, it can generate goals on. Uh, yeah, so um, there are two main research questions that we're interested in in our work. One is sort of is from the perspective of um, curriculum generation is like does this actually help my students? Um, does it how does it impact students uh, the students generalization performance and its learning progress? The second question is coming from the perspective of the teacher. So it's how does the actually impact the teacher's learning and its task generations? So starting with uh, from the student perspective. Um, we're going to sort of uh, look at uh, the student's reward um, or success rate on these transfer tasks. Um, if I haven't already explained this, uh, so in paired, they, the teacher generates entire environments from scratch, and then these environments that I'm evaluating success on are held out. Um, so that's how you can think about the test set. Um, so there are uh, four different variants of this. Um, uh, there's the original paired work, um, then there's if I just do rejection sampling, if I uh, don't do rejection sampling, but I add on this gradient norm term, and then if I do all three of them. So, um, yeah, so uh, on uh, the, one of the transfer environments, um, we have our base performance, so paired. Um, and if you continue training paired, it'll, it'll get better in the end, but uh, I'm just showing it for um, a part of the training. Um, if I do rejection sampling, I, you know, already very early on in training, I am able to perform really well. So it really shows that you cut out the redundancy in a lot of the, like, maybe tests that slow down um, the student's learning. Uh, gradient norm is not doing rejection sampling. It's just modifying the teacher's reward function. And we see that it's a little bit slower to catch on. But once it does, it does you know, surpass uh, the rejection sampling technique. And then if I combine both, um, you get you know maybe some version of best of both worlds where uh, my zone technique, it starts learning really early on and then it doesn't degrade like rejection sampling, it sort of stays around um, an 80% success rate. 
Um, and this was generally the trend that we saw in um, these really hard mini grid environments. Um, I want to emphasize that these environments are quite hard compared to all of the classical like continuous control evaluations, since the teacher here is generating environments completely from scratch. Um, so putting on these wall blocks, whereas um, in the continuous control environments, you're generating a single 2D goal. So if I generate a goal that's like very close to the original goal um, in the control setting, it's not going to be significantly harder. Um, but in these settings where you have a lot of obstacles, um, placing like the goal from one end of the room to like maybe a block that's two blocks away, so across on the other wall, does change the difficulty um, quite a lot. And the reason why I'm saying this is because like generally we saw um, a lot of benefits on the mini grid environment, so that's the top row here, as opposed to the control environment, which is the bottom row here. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe just to like give a short summary of the bottom row, which is new, um, we generally saw the, the, the uh, incentivizing for higher gradient norms and or doing gradient norms and rejection sampling was better than just doing uh, rejection sampling. Um, yeah, so uh, zone generally benefits the student on hard environments, and there are more results and analysis in the paper. Um, and maybe just to finish off, uh, we're going to now just briefly talk about how this impacts the teacher's learning um, and task generations. So first, task generations. Um, what I'm going to show here is the top row is going to be original paired at the start of um, training. So here the columns are corresponding to number of like model updates. Um, and the bottom row is going to be um, the combined versions, so the purple uh, lines that we saw before. So we can see early on um, that the environments look qualitatively very different from each other. Um, note here that these are also environments that have been kept after rejection sampling. So they meet the difficulty criteria of paired. Um, so they are you know, uh, within the difficulty that paired defines it as. And then as we go on, uh, we can see that uh, it's uh, original pair is still a little bit slower to pick up on like harder tasks, but um, we generally see more complex environments in um, our uh, you know, paired plus everything uh, setting. And we're also seeing like uh, sort of these continuous uh, blocks or wall blocks that um, you know, form corridors, which are quite useful for the transfer environments without having knowledge a priori of those transfer environments. And yeah, at some point then paired catches up with generating also similar like corridor environments. Um, we have this plot here that's um, in purple, this is like uh, everything put together. In gray, this is the original paired. Um, the x-axis is just describing the percentage of wall coverage in these environments. And then um, the y-axis is just describing frequency if I were just to take all of the, you know, like early environments here and then compare the two. So here we see that like there's a lot more wall coverage in um, the purple version than original paired. Cool. And then uh, thinking maybe a little bit more quantitatively for the uh, measuring the teacher learning. Um, performance with zone. Um, as our proxy, we're going to be taking the rejection rate. Uh, so like if I were to sample a batch from the teacher, um, which tasks would I like how what's the percentage of tasks I would actually reject because it's either outside it's outside of the difficulty criterion. We're also going to look at the students' gradient norms. Um, and note these aren't like perfect proxies, but at least it gets us to this idea of thinking about um, yeah, the, the teacher learning over time and maybe improving in the way it learns. So the first graph here showing rejection rate um, and notably uh, purple like immediately learns like how to sort of learn, learn to generate like tasks that would meet the student's criterion. Um, so uh, the x-axis is denoting the same thing as like uh, what we saw in the performance graph, which is training time um, or training steps. And then the y-axis is describing a uh, rejection rate between zero and one. Um, generally paired is a little bit slower to uh, learn how to reject. Um, gradient norm kind of is like meaning the same, uh, is going at the same velocity or same rate. Um, and the rejection uh, sampling method um, is much faster to pick up, although it's not uh, you know, 
it's uh, not as low as purple. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty cool was that the just observing the student's gradient norm. Um, so here we also have the same x-axis. Um, the y-axis here is now just the uh, gradient norm of the student. So that's coming from uh, whatever your base learning algorithm is. Um, and we have paired has a relatively flat, uh, uh, you know, uh, curve for its students. Um, and uh, whereas purple generally learns, like the student is starting to learn a lot more quickly. Um, yeah, so uh, this, this seems to be a quite interesting effect that um, we observed empirically, um, which you know nicely goes hand in hand, I guess, with the zone framework. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe to wrap things up, um, some takeaways from zone is that we're proposing zone as like this this framework that formalizes and operationalizes a really important idea that comes from human learning research, which is generating tasks or you know, teaching the students within the student CPD. Um, and the way that we are operationalizing this is proposing two very simple techniques. One is doing rejection sampling, and the other thing is adding this gradient norm term, um, which works very well, of course, when you're training your teacher um, using rewards. Um, and we see empirically that, like, it's in particular for very hard environments, like uh, the mini grid environment, we can really uh, accelerate learning and improve generalization. Um, and I think this opens like a lot of really interesting avenues that connect with um, a lot of emerging uh, exciting directions for either training RL agents um, in complex environments when you add in like you know, language or some type of like reasoning components in a setting. So um, yeah, thanks uh, for listening and I'm happy to, to, to take questions. Oh, yeah, Alexander. Hey, there, no, thanks for this talk. Um, it was all super interesting. I just had some questions. Um, I, I don't want to take them all because it probably take up too much time, but um, just for your maybe experiments to clarify, the mm -hmm. is there all those continuous control tasks like a sparse reward? Like, is it when it gets the goal, it gets the reward? Or are you using for like, do you, I think you had like on the maybe slide 30, I think it was like the walker tasks um, and stuff like that in your graphs? Uh, yeah. Oh, maybe maybe back one more. Back 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 one more. Uh, back again. I think. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Is that um, mind control walker. Okay. That like F is that deep mind control walker like the the you know tube thing with two legs. <laughs> yeah. This is. Um. Yeah. I guess. Um. So one thing I should have clarified, and I definitely do a better job in the paper, is. Um. So in the teacher formalism, I'm thinking about the. Like the thing I care about as oh sorry um uh one sec. in the teacher the formalism the thing I care about is just modeling the student's success um yeah so the, I I'm thinking about this as a binary variable from the teacher's perspective um, okay I so so from the teacher's perspective everything's binary from the student's perspective I I I'm just taking the original reward that um you know like existing <laughs> curriculum generation algorithms use. So they, these could either be sparse as in the um in many or the parrot work or Goldian, yeah. um, but um they can also be dense rewards from the student's perspective in these harder yeah. like control environments. Um so I'm just was, taking like the default environment cool. reward. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was looking at it and I was like, wow, it's done really, really well. If that was like getting a binary reward for the student kind of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right. yeah. Um it, it, yeah, it, I should have clarified at the beginning. Yes. Yeah, so there's like um, yeah, from because we care a lot about from the teacher's perspective, this is the reason why the formalism focuses a lot on modeling success as a binary variable. Um, and then, like I said, like we're we're not doing much intervention work here, um, so we're not intervening a lot in a lot of existing algorithms. So if it, if they use a, a denser work for training the student, then we're just going to use the denser work for training the student. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, cool. Um, but do you think when you're actually doing it, do you find how long did it take you to kind of get to that like curricular bound so it didn't like get too complex too fast or get too like easy, take too long to get complex? Was a lot of fine tuning involved to get that criteria? Or did you find that like this this approach just like you can kind of throw it at it and it works for most of these environments without playing around with it too much? Yeah. So, I mean, in all honesty, like the mini grid environment, like I just 
yeah, I, I just basically just built it out tasks that uh, don't get negative regret, and then it worked out of the box. So, like I said, it's like I, uh, I think like so. This is under review in iClear, and I think the the code that I uploaded is the paired code that builds. It's the it's the PyTorch version, and all I'm doing, if you take a look at it, it's like I'm just looking at the tasks that have has positive regret, and then copying yeah. those tasks, and that's all I'm doing. Yeah. So it really is like. Um, I didn't do any uh, tuning, I think, or you know, wherever tuning could be applicable to. Um, no, no, I sorry, I'm just going to this. I yeah. I'm, I'm you from a perspective where I've done a bit of work with like Poet, where you kind of have to like decide what the task distribution beforehand, right? Because Poet talks about this like mm -hmm. finite. Poet doesn't use these like grid environments that have allow for like a continuous control parameter. You define like a set of things you want to vary, and then they can I be. Think, a yeah. Um, so, like, what you select and then how they how they interact is not trivial to work out prior because, like, you don't know like if a block is going to be hard for an agent to move over and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, see. yeah. I, I, I think uh, I need to reread paired, but I remember paired like has a good mathematical motivation about like why the way you do it in paired is better than the way you do it in poet kind of thing that like is an order of mm -hmm. complexity. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It could also be like definitely the interaction with paired is a lot better for these. Uh, for this framework um yeah or it could just be like if you could parameterize uh, all the things that you care about in poet as just a continuous random variable and you're just sampling from that and then generating the environment and doing rejection sampling where you're just yeah you just care about success or not success then it should maybe work um yeah i haven't like looked into the uh, poet as too much yeah um yes um yeah, Mom just to, just to add to that, basically, like poet has this purely adversarial objective, which if you're doing that in a grid world, you're just going to make impossible environments. So we make the case that regret is better because you generate something that uh, the agent should, in principle, be able to solve, but is not doing as well as the optimal policy. Um, mm -hmm. But the interesting thing to emphasize here is you're rejecting examples that have negative regret. So you can think about why that might be a good idea, right? Like if you if you uh, train the teacher on an example where the you had negative regret, that's an example where the protagonist that you're trying to train does better the, than the antagonist. Um, the teacher is going to not want to generate that ever again, which is actually bad because now you're just saying, due to random initialization, the antagonist performed worse on some tasks and the teacher is going to like stay away from all those tasks. But they're actually important. You still want those to be in your training distribution, right? Yeah. So if you reject that, then you're not going to uh, have that problem, which is one way of thinking about it. Yeah, Edward. Oops, Hi, sorry. Uh, so this is a question to, uh, I guess, uh, Rose as well as broader audience. Um, let's say in terms of paired and this work that is building upon, um, this idea, like this idea of having a protagonist antagonist um i wonder uh whether it could incur so it can help the agent to learn and solve more difficult tasks but whether having these two competing agents uh incur more training time and and therefore have you thought about